this stuff is all going to be online on my website under this. And uh, if you have questions about it, you can come up and ask me afterwards or whatever. So, so the talk is about alien horrors from the dawn of time. And uh, in Unix, time is counted as a number of integer seconds since the beginning of time. So if you were run a program like this, well, I should have updated this. Now it's up to like 1.4 billion <coughs> seconds since the beginning of the universe. Um, and then you can convert these, uh, these numbers, which are called epoch <coughs> times, uh, into something that a human can read. Uh, there's a, a function in the C library called local time, and you can poke it with the curl this way, and it says, OK, it's 2011 or whatever. And if you ask it, oh, well, what's the date that corresponds to time zero? It says that it's. Um, the very beginning of 1970. I said local time, so it's adjusted five hours here for the time zone, but it's actually midnight universal time uh, at the beginning of 1970. That's when the universe began. <laughs> so, um, my own involvement with Unix is a little bit later than that. I've only been in it for 28 years now. Um, and in those days, I really uh, I look back at the stuff I wrote, most of which I still have, and wow, I really didn't know much. So. Here's a, here's a nice example. You run the man command, which gets you the manual page for, um, for some program that you don't know how to use. And it prints out, and uh, it had this incredibly rudimentary text formatting. It wanted to underline something, like say the letter W, it wanted to underline, print the W, and then it would print out this control H character, which um, in the days of paper terminals was a backspace. And it would actually cause the print head to move backwards one space on printers that could actually do that, which is not a guarantee. Um, and then it would print an underscore. So you'd get this like H overprinted with an underscore in the same spot, and that's an underline. Um, I'm sorry, did I say W? A w underprinted with, with an underscore. Um, and then similarly for boldface, it would do like a W and then a control H to back up and then it would print another W. And um, that works great on, um, on printing terminals, uh, printing printers, usually, unless they don't support that. Uh, and on CRTs, of course, it doesn't work at all, but they can hack the, the CRT terminal program, simulating program, to simulate that by just, oh, okay, I know what that means. It means boldface. Um, but the printer, the line printer we had in our lab didn't have reverse, reverse paper motion. It couldn't move the print head to the left. And so it would actually print out, when it was trying to print an underline W, it would print out a W and then an underscore. And then it would print the next letter and another underscore. And so you'd be like, blah, 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 blah. It's really hard to read. So I wanted a program that would filter that out before I sent it to the printer, because uh, then as now I like reading stuff on paper. Uh, and so here's what I wrote in C, because that's what I had, or that's what I knew. Um, who did C here? Who actually knows some C? A couple of people. Oh, well, look at that. Holy Christmas. <laughs> uh, folks all know uh, Fortran also? <laughs> <laughs> kind of 1965 era report generating language. Uh, anyway, let's see, what's this? It's, 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 I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Blah, 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 we run through the characters one at a time, quick when we see the end of file. And there's a flag here which is set to one if we set an underlying character. And um, if it is set, uh, and we kind of, what are we doing here? If it is set, then um, if the last character wasn't a control H, then oh yeah, okay, we actually are going to emit the underscore here because it was a real underscore. Um, but if it wasn't an underscore, then um, uh, if I'm not actually going to what's going on here. All right, let's see. Otherwise, let's see. If there is an underscore, we just set the flag and we don't actually print out the underscore. We're going to do that later if we needed it. And. Uh, if it wasn't an underscore, we'll just emit the character directly. Uh, so this is going to find when there's an underscore followed by a control H. And when there is, it's just going to eat it. Oh, I see. Yes. If C is a control H, then we don't emit the underscore or the control H. OK, this makes sense. We're losing a line off the bottom here. I don't know why that is exactly. It doesn't matter. It's just a close brace. Two close braces. All right. So. Um, if you know anything at all about C, you know that this isn't the way you do that. Um, you're invoking the formatted printing function to emit a single character, very inefficient. Uh, 1980, whatever, we still cared about that. So yeah, I really didn't know what I was doing. This looks very funny. Uh, these days, here's how we do it in Perl. I imagine the Python version is probably similarly short. Uh, 
Uh, Perl would say, we're gonna, this is a Perl incantation, it means loop over the lines in the input, uh, as long as there are any. Uh, and then if you find an underscore followed by a control H, S is substituted with what's between these two slashes, which is nothing, just remove it, and G means do add as much as possible on the current line, and then print out the result. Uh, or if you're really into Perl, um, you can put the minus T flag, which makes the while loop and the print implicit, and it turns into that. So in Perl, it could be literally a one-liner. Uh, and I wrote like 11 or 12 lines of C. Even in those days, my 13-line C program was not actually the right way to do this. Um, it wasn't even the third best way. The third best way I have decided is with this program called Lex. It's written, uh, built for, for writing lexers and tokenizers. And in Lex language, isn't this awesome? Like, like you can like, actually learn to read this stuff. Um, this says, basically, if you recognize an underscore followed by a character number uh, number eight as a control eight, of course it's number eight, right? That's, that's, that's base eight, right? Unix loves base eight. Uh, I am not entirely sure why. Uh, anyway, underscore control H, do nothing, but if you see this dot means anything else, then uh, this means print out the thing you just saw. Uh, next best way is with said. Said says it reads lines in a loop, and uh, then it does a substitution, just like the Perl substitution, throw away all the underscore control H's. Um, this is not a coincidence because Larry Wall was pitching Perl at people who already knew said and wanted them to accept it, and that worked okay. Um, so you could use said, but I didn't know said then. And then the best way is this program called Call, which was written even farther back than me to do exactly the thing that I wanted to be doing for exactly the same reason. Uh, and, oops, uh -oh. and so you would pipe it through Call minus B, which means filter out reverse printer motions because you're about to send this to a printer that can't do that. Um, so I did eventually find out about that. Um, the thing to learn from this is that Unix is a very robust, rich, and flexible system. And systems like this, there are many ways to solve the same problem. And that's good, because if you don't know or can't figure out one way, you might find another way. All right, well, that was enough of that. Um, this is the thing that uh, the first uh, device I used for programming. This is an ASR33 teletypewriter. I think they still do this. If you listen to like WINS 10, 10 a.m., there's this like, we're about to give you a news update with like music. Does this still happen? Yeah. Oh, okay. And then in the background, used to, I think they still have this, but I'm not sure. There are these that is this. Because that's how they got the news when they first made that recording sometime before I was born. Um, uh, let's see, what is this? This is an optional panel which might have been replaced by an acoustic coupler, um, which is a, a thing with these two rubber suction cups, and you take the receiver of your Western Electric phone, and <laughs> because you don't have a modem, and it, that's how it talks through the phone to the computer on the other end. Well, I'm sorry, we don't have a picture of that here. This is the paper tape punch and paper tape reader. Uh, and unfortunately, you can't see the clear plastic box down here that the little punch chads fall into. When I was three years old, I spilled that chad box, and there were still chads, like this really greasy paper. There were still these little tiny round chads stuck between the floorboards of that room when we moved out of that apartment three years later. And that's why when the 2000 election came around and everybody was like, chads? What are chads? I was like, oh, I, I know what that is. Um, and these keys are just horrendous. Look at them, right? And if you fat finger the key, you don't just hit the wrong key. Your finger gets jammed down between these two sharp edged little <laughs> cylinders. And you say, ow! Um, and so people are often like, why is the Unix command set so horrible? Why do you type ls instead of list? Why do you type rm instead of remove? It just makes it bad for beginners to learn. That is the problem with this. What is wrong with those idiots? And the answer is, <laughs> they were using this, and saving keystrokes was a real concern. And oh, and I forgot to mention also, right, that you could only the transmission of data through this acoustic coupler thing was only 10 megabits per second. No, wait, I'm sorry, 10 kilobits per second. No, 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 no. That's um, 10 characters per second. 10 <laughs> characters per second. And they weren't even 8-bit characters, they were 7-bit ASCII characters. So it's even worse than you think. 
So, so saving keystrokes was a big deal, and you've got to remember that when you look at Unix. All right, I'm sorry, I talked about this way too much, but man, it's funny, isn't it? All right, <laughs> Unix terminal devices are still called TTYs even now for teletypewriter. You, the TTY command you can run, and it'll tell you what teletypewriter you're using. This used to be like dev TTY too. These days they're PTS, which is I forget what exactly. I don't remember what P is for. So S is for the unpleasant word slave. All right. Oh, oh, yeah. I didn't actually talk about it there. I got so much, so much wrapped up in the teletype. All right. So, yeah, the Unix editor was called Head. This is the first Unix editor program. Before Bill Joy wrote VI and before Stallman wrote Emacs, there was this Head thing called Line Editor. And we're going to have a really short demo of that because I bet none of you have ever seen one. All right. Who has actually seen one? A couple of people. Okay. This is actually this is going to be brief and educational. I hope you know. You can see this. Bigger? It's okay? The guy in the back are nodding, not squinting. Slightly bigger? Okay, one slide. More bigger? Slightly one more. More? That's just so crazy. Keep going. <laughs> Where am I? Thompson, 
the inventor of Unix has an automobile, which he helped design. And unlike most automobiles, it has neither a speedometer or a gas gauge or any of the numerous idiot lights which plague the modern driver. Rather, if the driver makes any mistake, a giant question mark lights up in the center of the dashboard. Stroking his beard hair, the experienced driver, he says, will usually know what's wrong. I think that phrase might actually be quoted from the man page for Ed. Um, so yeah, so that's, if you ever see this joke again, you'll know they're talking about Ed and it's error message. Oh, let's see. Ed was actually really a huge advance over previous line editors. So it was the first application of regular expressions, which uh, Thompson had invented the matching algorithm for this a few years before. It was published in 1968. And so when we did that little search for, like, look for a thing that, a line that doesn't have a space, that's Thompson's regular expression matcher going on there. Uh, and the regular expressions were really sophisticated, and this was like a, a really big application of computer science. It still is. Uh, and uh, I don't want to explain this. We're already on already okay. too much rambling. Uh, anyway, so you could do slash regular expression slash, and we'd go find the next line in the file that matched the regular expression. You'd say slash re slash, and then a command, and it would find the next line and execute some command on it. Uh, if you did prefix it with a G, it would execute it globally. It would find all the matching lines and execute the command on it. Uh, and if the command was P, it would print out the matching line. So this means find all the all the lines of the file that match this regex and print it. Print each one, and that's why we call this thing grep. And so if you're ever wondering about that, there's the answer to that bizarre piece of trivia. Um, and another variation on Ed was this thing called SED, which stands for Stream Editor. It's kind of like Ed, except it wasn't interactive. It would read through the file line by line and perform an Ed command or multiple Ed commands on each line. Uh, and so, uh, here we are saying, okay, sed minus e means your little head program is right here. Uh, take each line, substitute colon followed by any sequence of characters, and replace it with nothing. So if you've got like grep output that includes file name colon matching line, then you can trim out the file names with this thing, which I do surprisingly often. So that's sed. Um, a few years ago, some sysadmin asked me, you know, should I learn sed? Useful. Even when you said, said no, said's obsolete. No, it's a waste of time. Use Perl, Python, one of those P languages instead. Um, but there was actually a time when like said was useful, and I got my first professional job partly on the basis of like being a 20-year-old who knew how to use said, which was never common. Uh, and they were like, yeah, we were really impressed with said on your resume. Who knew? I just threw it in because my dad told me I'll put everything you can think of on your resume. That's right. <laughs> and uh, when Perl first came out, it was pitched to people who was like, well, I could just use said for that. Like, yeah, but you won't want to. You want to use this new thing instead. Uh, and so it came with this S2P program that would take your said script and emit a corresponding Perl script, both to help you learn Perl and also to help you phase out said, if that's what you wanted to do. So this was like a real concern at one time. Let's do that. All right. Using said is very tough. Uh, I thought, okay, I will wow everybody with an awesome example of said mastery. And this was very uh, ambitious because I'm not actually a said master, just the opposite. Um, anyway, so but let, let's say we've got an input like this. We've got a heading line, and this thing is underlined, and that's how you know it's a heading line. And then there's some body text that, that doesn't get any kind of special formatting because uh, it's not underlined with asterisks. And we want to turn that, we want to strip out the asterisks and replace the heading in capitals. Okay, cool. Uh, and if we were doing this in a P language, this is going to be easy. The strategy is, okay, we're going to uh, read a line and hold onto it. And then while well, we check to see if the next line is, is the corresponding asterisks. Uh, and if it's not, we will print out the help line uh, and hold the next line instead. <coughs> but if it is asterisks, we'll reformat the help line and print it out and then uh, discard the asterisks, right? Good? All right. So then let's see. So uh, my Perl's much better than my Python, so oh boy, this is a horrible mess. Um, but you know, Perl. Um, so we're reading lines one at a time, and let's see. If it, this is a regex that asks if the line is some character followed by one or more appearances of exactly the same character, uh, and if we have a held line already, and if the length of the current line is equal to the length of the held 
line, ah, is an underline. So not just asterisks, but like equal signs or hyphens or whatever, right? Um, and then we will print out the uppercase version of the headline, helpline, and then throw away the helpline so we don't see it again. Uh, if not, then if there's a helpline, we print it out, and then we take the current line and save that instead. Good? All right. Yes, please. Where does it say to throw out the, the special character line? Uh, throw out the asterisks? Yeah. Uh, is it okay if I point with this thing? Yeah. So the asterisks have just been read in and they are in dollar underscore here, right? Um, dollar underscore is a Perl jargon thing for like what's the last line I read. Uh, so they're in on dollar underscore. We print out the help line and then we discard the help line, but we never save dollar underscore anywhere. Okay. So it's never going to get printed. Corresponding down here is, well, we saw something that isn't asterisks. We're going to print out the previous help line, and then we're going to save dollar underscore and dollar held for meta for the next line. That's good. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Oh, I meant to start this by announcing that since I'm from New York, I talk way too fast. And I'm really sorry, especially for those of you who are not native English speakers. Uh, but I don't know what to do about it. So feel free to <laughs> stop me and ask questions. <laughs> Uh, or also feel free to like grab me afterwards and say, what was that part where you were going rub, 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 rub? Uh, And I will apologize and I won't be upset. Anyway, so this is kind of skanky code, but it's, you know, there's nothing tricky about it. So here's said. Said automatically reads in the lines one at a time into what's called a pattern space. I don't know why they call it a pattern space. Uh, and then you give it a script, which has a bunch of different components, each of which probably has like uh, some kind of regex or something. And it looks for something that will match the current pattern space. And if it does, it executes the associated commands. And then after having done that, it then prints out whatever is still in the pattern space. And maybe the commands it executed modify the pattern space. Uh, unless the command was a D, which means delete this line, in which case the print is suppressed, or Q, which terminates the entire program. Uh, and the big, big problem with said is it doesn't have any variables. It has a pattern space. Um, so what am I going to say here? Oh, okay, all right, uh, no problem. Uh, said has also another space where you can store something called the hold space, where you can hold something for later processing. And there's an X command which says exchange the pattern space and the hold space. So save what's in the pattern space for later. Get me back the hold space from before. Uh, and uh, that's what you've got. So here's my rough cut at, uh, at the said program. So uh, I don't need to explain this, right? <laughs> uh, OK, so a little slower. Let me see. Well, um, that's actually a big improvement, is it? What are we doing here? I actually don't remember this very well. Let's see. One here is the pattern. This matches the first line of input and no other. Uh, H means take this current line, the first line, sort it with a whole space, and then D means don't print it. Okay, so we're just going to save the first line. We'll print it out later when we get the second line. It's good so far? All right, so so far that wasn't too hard. Uh, and in most lines, there's no pattern, so it applies by default to everything. The X command is X, which just swaps the hold space and the pattern space. So we get the previous line, which is the hold space, the current line and the pattern space. We put the, pattern, the current line into the hold space, get the hold space back into the pattern space, and then set's going to automatically print it when it's done executing the program for this line. Is that good? Oh, look, that's why it's called X. <laughs> I totally wasn't expecting that to happen. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so this is the interesting part. This is a pattern that is trying to match the underscores. A lot like the Perl pattern, except it has even more punctuation because, incredibly, when Larry Wall adapted this stuff to Perl, he actually did his best to cut down on the punctuation. It's hard to believe, I know. Uh, and so this means, okay, look for a dot. Uh, sorry, look for any character, and then look for that same character again, and then look for zero or more occurrences of that same character again. So we've got at least two and possibly a zillion. Uh, although I think said actually has a built-in limit of 1,024 characters per line. That was, believe it or not, one of the big selling points of Perl when it first came along. Was, hey, you don't have to worry about said quietly truncating your lines if they're too long. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, we really struggled up from all right, let's see. Then what do we do? Uh, if it's an underscore, we are going to fetch back the previous line, the line that's being underscored, uh, from the hold space. 
then y here means to transform, transliterate character by character. And it means replace these characters with the corresponding characters from this side. So replace all the lowercase letters with uppercase letters. Um, that's in the line that we just got back from the whole space. Uh, and then stick this back in the whole space and throw away the underscores. What the heck? I don't even remember what this is doing. Uh, 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 there must be some other thing that's going to actually print this later. Uh, what are you doing? Why did they not print it? Oh yeah, we don't want to print it. Oh yeah, we put this back in the whole space so that the next line will switch it and then print it out. That's right. We have to put it back in the whole space just as if that were what we had read in the first place. Is that clear? Okay. Good. Sorry, I find this stuff intensely confusing. Uh, all right, so then let's see, it's got some problems. Uh, the last line of the input is left in the hold space and never gets printed. So we add one last instruction. This thing means execute this program only for the last line, uh, print it out, and then, uh, uh, I don't think so. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah, 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 because there was an earlier part of the program that, um, that already stashed the last line on the whole space. We have to pull it out on the last line. I'm sorry, I don't remember. Like you want to stick the last print? line, and then you also want to swap it, print the previous line. Yeah, except that seems to be in the wrong order, right? <laughs> it's possible that my program just has a bug. I'm not going to claim it's better than this. <laughs> <it is. laughs> you just need an X to explain what? it. You just need an X, it needs to be X, P, X, because you want to get the, you want to print what's in the whole space first, and then it, you want it, to print. It certainly it. seems so, but then the trailing X is totally unnecessary, because by that time we've printed the entire input. As a comment to the bottom of the slide. Sir? Where are you? Aditya. Aditya. Nice yes. to meet you. Right. right. Okay. There's a comment to the bottom of the screen. Uh, that maybe it's time. Let's see. Then we extract the last line again, and so it'll be automatically, we print the line that was there. Oh yeah, yeah, the last line has already come in, and it's already been handled by the catch-all. So the last line is in the hold space, and we now have the next to last line. So we print the next to last line, and then we X so that this is so that the last line comes out of the hold space, and then said we'll print it automatically. So, so yeah, thank you. Right. Yeah, I mean this doesn't work real well, but I did actually test it, and I don't think it has any really major. I wrote a test suite and everything. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes I'm really tempted not to do that. I don't know how to get this right. This is not one of those times. All right. So it still has some problems. Let's see. If the last lines of the input are heading, they don't get handled. Um, because let's see, we uppercase the hold space, and then D skips the print. And then uh, if that was the last line, then it comes here. And, Oh, the D means to skip the rest of the program, so I guess this never happens. Uh, I try the last line you need to put in the sorry before the end uh, if, it was the, if the last line is a row of underscores, the upcase is the next line. Anyway, look, let's talk about this another time. I don't want to get totally bogged down in this thing. I'm not sure I'm supposed to be talking about this set. Um, I'd be glad to talk to you about it later. Anyway, uh, it also treats all repeated characters like underlines. The Perl program had a feature where like, this thing had to match the length of that thing. Uh, but it wouldn't process this specially, and it wouldn't process this. Um, Perl has this nice, easy length test here uh, that we could use for that. Said, as far as I can tell, has no easy way to do that, to compare the lengths of the pattern in the whole space. Uh, and I tried to, um, I tried to, I really tried so hard to fix this. Like, okay, I said, okay, I will append the pattern space to the whole space, producing that, and then I can write a loop that successively substitutes characters out from the first part and from the second part. Uh, boy, doesn't that look awesome? You know you're doing real programming when you write something like that. Um, and then like, I can't even remember. Oh, and then it tries to see, oh, is the only thing that's left begin with two new lines? And if it does, then they were equal length. And if not, they were unequal length, uh, I think. Um, T is a test here, and if, if the last command was successful, like if the substitution actually did something, then it transfers control to the label, um, and the colon thing is a label. Um, I really, really wanted to impress everybody with how awesome I am with said, but uh, I'm not. <laughs> I couldn't get it to work. Somebody else wants to fix this and show me how to fix it, I will be grateful. 
Uh, all right. So moving along, I'm sorry that was my that was my like utter set failure. I worked on this and finally I was like, all right, man, I just can't do this. Uh, any questions before we go on to the next thing? How are we doing on time? Hopefully going to work. It's 11:30. Oh, that's not so bad. This is where I expected to be. <laughs> Despite my incredible ramping up the teletypewriter. <laughs> All right, let's see. And then there's this thing called the shell, which is the thing you type your commands to in Unix. And then you type ls, and then the shell says, oh, OK, I can run ls for you. And it does that. And it prints another prompt. And then you type uh, rm minus rf slash. And OK, I can run rm minus rf slash for you. And it goes and does that. And you, run, you, know, you type a pipe, and it sets up the pipe. And then it runs the programs connected with pipes. It's really totally awesome. The original shell was pretty weak. No pipes. It hadn't been invented yet. They were invented by a guy named Kate. McElroy, sorry, um, who, uh, okay, sorry, I uh, Irrelevant, I guess. Let's see. And, yeah, because it had to fit into 8K of memory in 1971. Um, 19, by 979, they had a better shell written by uh, Stephen Bourne, to this day called Bourne Shell. Uh, and uh, people started using it immediately. It's way better. We still have it. It's, like the Unix shell, it's the default. You want to program in Unix before there was Perl, Python, and all those other awesome things, you either, you had kind of two, two choices, two and a half choices. You write a shell, uh, you write in C, which many of you have now told me you understand the suffering of that. Um, you could use one of these weird monsters like Sed or Lex. Um, and then I, for some reason when I made this slide the first time, I totally forgot about Walk. Uh, what came along somewhat later, um, but it is definitely a proto-P language. Um, it's a real language, it has real semantics, it has functions, it has arithmetic, all this stuff, everything that you would expect a language to have. So really, maybe like one of the earliest really modern languages. Um, and if you look at it, it's going to look a lot like whatever you used to script again. Um, talk about what P language. Sorry, Fred. So if you needed complex data structures, you use the C. Because that was what worked. Walk had like some stuff, but not enough. Nothing interesting. Um, and if you needed to do low-level system operations like network I/O or process management or inter-process communication, you use C. And if you didn't have to do either of those things, you use the shell because C really, really sucks. Um, the shell sucks also, but it sucks as much as C. It's okay for uh, reading user input, it's good for formatting text, it's good for running commands that already exist. Uh, all right. So here's how I learned Perl. I'm now actually one of the like foremost Perl experts in the world, as strange as that may seem. Um, I had uh, written in 1991 this in C, a utility called Classify, uh, which I then released publicly, which in those days was a much bigger production than it is now where you just post it on GitHub. Uh, I took this large group of files and it would compare them pairwise to decide which ones were identical and say, okay, well this group of 17 are all the same and this group of four are all the same but different from the first 17 and this one is a weird outlier. Uh, and people were using this and uh, at the 1992 Usenix, which is like the big conference for Unix sysadmins, uh, I showed it to somebody and he, I don't remember even who it was, uh, but he said to me, oh, you should have written this in Perl. And I was, I was really irritated. I don't need Perl. I'm really good with C, and so then I like all right, but I couldn't I couldn't argue with it because I didn't know Perl. I didn't actually know like what's the what's the rebuttal to that. So I went off and I learned Perl so that I could like come back to this guy and say, "Ha, you were wrong," but actually it was right. Uh, and here I am now, 23 years later. All right. So so all right. I don't know why I repeated this slide. I had a reason. For it. All right. So what if you needed low-level operations from C and you needed nice text formatting, which you can't get from C, it's a huge pain. Well, so the experienced pr practitioners in Unix yeah. use the following strategy. They write the whole thing in shell, but at the point at which it needs to do something difficult, like talk on the network or manage processes, you write a little tiny C command, the smallest possible thing, as an extension to the Unix command set, and you have the shell invoke that as a program and gather its output or whatever. Uh, and so, for example, if you wanted your shell to manage the process table, you wouldn't write the process table stuff in, pro in, uh, in shell. You would call out the external PS program that somebody had written for you already that produces a process listing. Uh, and if the command you 
one, it didn't exist, you would write it in C and extend your shell script that way. So here's a, a really extreme example. The very earliest shell didn't have file blocks. If you asked for star.c, it wouldn't expand that into the list of files because that function, the shell only had 8k of memory to run in, and that function would have made it too big, so they left it out. Uh, instead, there was a glob command, or written in C. Yeah, we we'll do the same thing. And I don't know why this is scrolling off the bottom. Why I can't even scroll down. Uh, let's say glob star dot c, and glob would get this star literally, and would say, okay, then it would read the current directory, find the matching files, and print out their names, and then in the shell, you could say go to glob dot c and take its output. That's what these back ticks mean, and feed that to ls minus l, just those files. So the globbing was actually an external command in the first shell. <coughs> uh, Born shell did not, and I think still does not, have arithmetic built into it. It's the only, yes, yeah, sir? Uh, Born versus Born again shell? Like Born, okay. So uh, Born shell was written by Stephen Born in 1979. And then when the GNU project came along and they were writing their replacements for every one of the standard Unix tools, trying to do them but better uh, so that people would use them. Uh, they wrote a replacement for the shell, which in a pun they called the born again shell. That's bash. Yeah. Right. So the original shell, SA is a born shell, and then the new replacement, which has more features, is bash. Okay. Any other questions? Clear? Good. So yeah, the born shell didn't have a arithmetic. Uh, the born again shell does, actually. Um, but. Uh, it's like the only seriously proposed programming language I've ever seen. Like, not this is not a joke, but it doesn't do arithmetic. Uh, I can't think of any other programming language that fits that description. Uh, anyway, but there was an external command written in C called expert, and you would give it a bunch of arguments describing the calculation you wanted to do. You say expert five plus four, and then it would print to the standard output, it would print the result. Uh, or if you needed to do formatted output like C's printf function, well, somebody wrote a printf command. It was basically a wrapper around the C language printf to produce formatted output. And you give it this C-like formatting string, and then a bunch of things you want formatted, and then it prints them out in the format that you said. This minus 6s means like, justified in a field six characters wide, left justified, blah, blah, blah. So this is a very typical approach. Uh, one of my favorite inventions, really, really useful at one time, uh, was this thing called Netcat, which you would give it a, a host name and a port, it would open an internet socket, connect to that host and that port, and then read standard <coughs> input and send it over the socket, and anything that came back from the remote host, it would print the standard output. And so suddenly your shell script could talk on the network. Uh, it was, wasn't hard to do. Uh, and uh, you could do all kinds of stuff with it. So like here, does anybody know what finger is? Okay, so finger is this protocol no longer used where if you wanted to find out if someone was using a certain remote machine or maybe a little bit about them, you could say finger user at host. It would connect to the finger seed server on that host and then ask them, what do you, can you tell me about user? And it might tell you whether they were logged in or not, or if they were idle, or what their email address was, or it might like dump out the contents of a little .project file that was in their home directory if they had one. Um, we don't have this anymore. But the protocol was super simple. And so here's an implementation of the finger client. In shell, take the first argument, that's the person I want to finger, uh, and print that. That's echo is print. Um, and then send it into netcats. Argument two is the host name. And port 79 is where the finger daemon resides. And since we didn't redirect the standard output here, the output of netcat, which is whatever the server sends back, would just get printed on the terminal. So just contact the server, send the request. Well, smallest network client you're ever going to see. Um, you know, aided and embedded, of course, by the fact that the protocol had nothing to it. <laughs> um, once there was this, there used to be this like giant worldwide bulletin board system called Usenet that was uh, ultimately destroyed by spam in the early 90s. Um, but like the first really big distributed bulletin board on the internet is this thing Usenet. And then there was this program you sometimes had called PNews for posting to Usenet. Um, when it would prompt you for like, okay, what do you want to post? And uh, are you sure you want to send this to the whole world? Is everybody really going to be interested? And of course, you would say yes. Um, and uh, so I needed to write a replacement for someone who didn't have news posting, Usenet posting software on his computer. So I wrote it in a shell. And uh, it's just a giant shell script that prompted you with all the same stuff. You edit your news post or whatever. 
And then the shell script would read that in and append some, uh, net, some Usenet protocol stuff at the beginning and the end. And it would take the whole thing and pipe it into Netcat, which would then send it off to the news server. Uh, and, uh, and what? This is coming from the thing that you prepared. That's the port where the Usenet server resides. Uh, and you can use that even if you are, don't have it on your machine. You can contact a remote news server. It still works. Uh, and then you pipe the output from the direct carrot 4, because just like with HTTP, the error responses all begin with 4s. So uh, there's a long tradition of that. Um, successful responses begin with 2s, just like in HTTP. Of course, this was years before HTTP, so they copied that, because all right, everybody already knows that. Um, the uh, mail exchange protocol works the same way as MTP. So um, the shell, unlike said, which is like, which I, I, I said is a weird monster, and I'm going to stick with that. Um, the shell is a real programming language. It's kind of clumsy, and the syntax is weird, but it's got everything it has to have except maybe arithmetic. But you can get the arithmetic anyway. Um, so as a funny demonstration, this person, Zach Holman, who works for GitHub, wrote this little script a while back called Spark. Where you give it a list of numbers, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 5, 3, 1, and here it is, make it little bars. 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 5, 3, 1, right? Uh, and then you could tell the shell, oh, okay, well, when you're about to figure out what my prompt is after every command, uh, run Spark on something of interest and include that in my prompt. So, like, each command, you see, like, a little graph of something or other. Um, that's the idea. Uh, and that's kind of fun, but uh, the arithmetic. Uh, in the original version was completely, completely broken because the shell doesn't have a arithmetic. You put in a bunch of numbers, it tries to scale them all to the size of the largest bar, but the shell doesn't have arithmetic in it. It doesn't have fractions. And it would get the fractions wrong. It would like truncate them or like things would come out totally the wrong sizes because the arithmetic is so crappy. Um, and you can't get fractions with Exper because Exper only does integers. When I was preparing this talk, I did some research into expert trying to figure out like why, like is it? No, it's just it looks actually honestly like somebody's high school project. Uh, in all seriousness, uh, it's it's inferior to what was there before. I thought, okay, well they did expert first, then they realized they needed better calculations, so they wrote these calculator programs. No, it postdates the calculator programs that actually work. Uh, so, okay, well, I, they put it in just as a demonstration of Lex and Yak. No, Lex and Yak have been there for years. I totally stunk. It's junk. Uh, I think I wrote it to Kernahan and asked, who put this thing in and why? And it's like, enjoy um, But and yet, here it is. It's constantly used in shell programming, even though it's trash. Uh, expert only does integers, so you say expert 23 divided by 7. Three! Everybody knows who this person is? <coughs> Uh, all right, so there is this book uh, called The Siberiad by Stanislav Lem, who is probably the foremost Polish science fiction writer of the last century. Uh, and it's about this guy here, Troll, who is a robot uh, and is an inventor of robots. Everybody in this book is mechanical. And in the first chapter, Troll has invented this like 18-story tall computer that's supposed to be the smartest computer in the world. And he finally got it working. He switches it on, the lights come on, they blink, and so he's like, gonna give it his first test. Alright, computer, how much is two plus two? And the computer thinks. Seven! <laughs> so that's, that's this guy. Uh, and there's an expert. What's 23 divided by seven? Three! Let's see. Uh, oh yeah, okay, but the GNU shell, morning get shell put in built-in arithmetic, which also only does integer calculation. <laughs> Why? It's like, oh yeah, well, fractions weren't invented at the time this program was written. You can't expect us to include the latest and greatest technology, every little feature you think is important. Well, what are fractions, anyway? I, 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 I cannot comprehend the mind of the person who in like 1989 wrote this. It's like, okay, we'll just have it throw away the fractal. <laughs> Speechless with astonishment. All right, so, but this BC thing called a basic calculator, 
which I thought was standard in Unix. Ah, it gets it right. Yes, Scratch, you have to include the minus L flag because it's an optional feature. <laughs> Leave this off, it truncates it to three. <laughs> okay, I mean, I don't know, 1979 and fractions were still a new thing or something, so. What did BC stand for? Basic calculator. And then there's a better version called DC, which is desk calculator, which I don't know how to use. <laughs> it's programmable. And what I really need in my life is another programming language. So, so I've never learned it. Uh, all right, basic calculator, yeah. All right, so no, actually there's two problems here. One of them is, turns out that BC is non-portable. So if you put it in your shell script and somebody tries to run your Spark shell script on their machine, it might fail at this point. Say, BC, command not found, because it's only been in Unix since 1979. <laughs> and so why would you expect everyone to have it? <laughs> so this is why we love computers, right? All right. And the other thing is, this is, yes? Which, um, I guess, Unix implementations does it not? Yeah. Uh, I don't recall, I'm sorry. I would have to look up my emails with uh, Holman about this. Uh, and it may be also that, uh, uh, that, that's right. that it's not true. Right. And he said, I don't think it's available everywhere. You know, the portability goes. Um, but, uh, so, so it could be wrong, too. I may be telling you a lot. But the other, other uh, objection is legitimate, which is that um, forking a new process and running BC is relatively slow. And uh, for a command you want one runs once per prompt, uh, even a small delay is unacceptable. Uh, and I can buy that. Where's it? Sorry, what's so you really did So this is for Spark. Yeah, which breaks a little graph. You can use that as your you know, the idea is that you put that in you tell the shell to like run that to insert a little graph into your prompt after every command. Uh, a graph of something of interest. System load history maybe. Um, or how long you send on each task, or I don't know, like, or how much email is in each of your 17 email boxes, right? That kind of thing. Something you'd want to be notified of on every prompt. That's that's the that's the original use case. And, okay, for that, you know, all right, fine. You want to say BC is too slow? I might think you're wrong, but I'm not going to say it's uh, not a legitimate concern. Um, so uh, so what do we do here? So okay. Um, and say, okay, well, maybe we can use integer arithmetic internally and somehow, and you know, actually, it turns out you really got to deal with the fractions because the input to this thing might be fractions. And the original version of, of Spark um, you know, might be fractions. And if you ran this, it would not. Say, so I can't even understand these numbers. 4.9? What is 4.9? Is that even a digit? I don't think that's a digit. So, so my version actually works. Um, there it goes, and it's like the number of the bars are all scaled properly, all to the as best as you can do with like these little tiny, they're, they're, they're stacks of bars up to eight high, so it goes from zero to eight. You gotta scale a bunch of numbers to zero, from zero to eight, you know, something's gotta give at some point. Uh, but it does the best it can uh, and in a mathematically rigorous sense. Uh, and how do I manage to do this without calling out CC? Well, it's funky, and I think you're gonna enjoy it. So. Um, you can actually do fractional arithmetic in the shell, even though it's not built in, or even though the built in isn't there, and even though calling out is too slow. The trick is use rational number arithmetic instead of floating point. Who knows what rational number arithmetic is? Rational number is a number with a numerator and a denominator. And you all learned in third or fourth grade or something how to add these rational numbers with numerator and denominator plus numerator and denominator, and multiply them. Right. And you can do that not knowing anything about decimal expansions or decimal points. In fact, you compute entirely with integers. Each one has two integers. Uh, so <coughs> 3.45 won't work. Uh, you can't pass it to expert, blah, 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 blah. But you can't do this floating point arithmetic. But 3.45 is 69 20th. <coughs> and you can store 69 and 20, and you can manipulate it. So we're going to say if we've got a number x, which is equal to 3.45, it has a numerator, xn, which is 69, and a denominator, xd, which is 20. And then what do we do with this? Well, multiplication turns out to be pretty simple. Instead of using the bash built-in multiplication, which doesn't work, uh, because it only works on integers, say, OK, well, x has a numerator, and y has a numerator, and the numerator of the result is just the product of those. <coughs> And it has a denominator, and y has a denominator, and the, new, the, the denominator of the product is the product of the denominators, just like you learned in third grade. Right, so now we've multiplied 
x and y, and we got z. And division is equally simple, uh, except that instead of multiplying the numerators, you cross multiply. Numerator by denominator, and denominator by numerator. Right? Everyone's good on this, right? Not like somehow microaggressing people by saying, well, you learned this in third grade. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, if so, uh, I apologize, and I'll be glad to discuss it with you later. Uh, yes, please, ma'am. So this is the. So this is the, the thing where you flip <coughs> over and then do the cross? Yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. We flipped over. We want to divide x by y. So we flip y upside down and then we multiply. Yeah. And that's exactly what's going on there. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. All right. So let's see. Then uh, addition and subtraction are a little more complicated, but not too much. It turns out that it's this. Uh, and if you actually like write it down on paper, you'll say, oh, yeah, of course, it's that. Um, the denominator is just as simple. And then let's see, where do we go from there? And the answer is, oh, well, actually, you have to still handle the 2.45 input. Because somebody's going to give you 2.45, you got to figure out how to turn that into 6920s. Uh, the shell arithmetic operators don't work on it, so you can't do arithmetic on it. Well, but what you can do, at least in born again shell, is you can pattern match on it. <laughs> so you can say, OK, well, dollar one looks like some sequence of characters followed by a literal dot, followed by another sequence of characters. Uh, then the integer part is the part before the dot. The fractional part is the part after the dot. And then um, oh, the numerator is, here's what we're going to do. We're going to say it was 2.45. We're going to say the numerator is now 245, 245. Yeah. <laughs> and the denominator, well, hey, integer arithmetic works great for that. It's 10 to the power of uh, whatever the length of the fractional part was. In this case, since the fractional part had two digits, it's 10 squared, it's 100. So we got 245 over 100 without doing any, uh, without doing any arithmetic except this integer power of 10 here. Oh, and if it doesn't match, that means it doesn't have a decimal point. So the numerator is whatever the original number was, and the denominator is 1. Good? This is a hack. And then the script will do something like this. It's got this function in it called two rational, which we just saw, and convert the input argument to a rational, and that puts it into like xn, y, uh, and xd. And then there's a bunch of like other rational numbers. It has to do arithmetic. Oh, it puts it into n and d. That's right. There's a bunch of other rational numbers here. Range and min. Those are the range of the sparks and the minimum value for the sparks. And uh, you can figure out what's actually happening, happening here. Uh, and then eventually, if we end up um, with, uh, with the actual number that's being represented, say 69 over 20. Uh, and at that point, we use integer arithmetic to divide and say, oh, that's, uh, that's 3. Uh, because you know, then we have to actually output it as a bar 3 bars high. Um, and then we print out the appropriate character, character number 3 from this array here, which is the one that the Unicode character, that's a stack of three little bars, and we're done. And if you want to round this off instead of rounding down, you just have to, oh, wait, I already put that in, actually. Because um, we want to round it to the nearest integer, you add a half before we do the truncation. Right? Everybody knows that trick? If you want to round to the nearest integer, you add a half, and then you throw away the fraction. That's good. All right. Um, so actually, this rounds off, not rounding down. And the code is here if you want to look at it, except you kind of already see it. Uh, anyway, that's done. And now it's time for us to all go to lunch. Yes, are you Paul? Chris Paul? Yes. Thanks. Nice to meet you. What does Holman say about your rational version? Uh, something sufficiently disappointing that I don't remember what it was. <laughs> um, uh, like something like it was. It was something along the lines of, "Well, that's really interesting, but it's too crazy, and who cares if the bars are the right height anyway?" <laughs> so it was like disappointing at that level. Um, but I think I actually invented like actually a useful technique for shell programming. It's, it is crazy. I totally admit that. But here I think it was the right amount of crazy. Um, sorry, I didn't. Yeah, okay. Uh, any questions before we all go back to what we're supposed to be doing? Uh, feel free to grab me later, or uh, I will uh, zoom the uh, link to the slides if you want to see them again. Thank you.